I hated the inevitable question. Do you have any siblings, Dana? I used to lie and just say no. That usually elicited a comment about me being an only child. But I wasn't an only child. My sister and I were together. We were each other's witness to the pain and wonder of our childhood, the drama and fun of adolescence. At the pinnacle of my formative years, my sister died. It was November 1994. I was 17. I had to walk by her old locker in our high school. Kids in school stared and whispered. I imagined them saying, poor Dana, Val died so suddenly. I hated the pity. I hated people asking, how are you doing? It was they who wanted to be soothed by the answer. The truth? I couldn't get past the period without crying. I hid my grief in the nurse's office so many times, she eventually told me I couldn't go there anymore. I drove 45 minutes to cry in my mother's arms. I smoked blunts at my boyfriend's house. Work at Ben & Jerry's was an escape, too. It was the next town over, and customers were strangers. I focused on scooping ice cream, rattling off flavor ingredients, listening to my music, decorating cakes, and cleaning. Val was away at college when she died. At my dad's house, her room was the vacated shell that used to house this messy, ballsy, cool calamity that had inhabited it for four years. Her books... The Scarlet Letter, Bell Jar, Tom Robbins, her punk alternative 80s metal CDs, and her furniture now all felt staged. Her room was always a mess. This museum to her was too tidy, and it felt empty. I'd grab one of her books every so often, or flip through her journals. I listened to her CDs, which still felt like borrowing for a while, until I finally incorporated them into my collection. Val was a fearless lover of life. She was the definition of giving zero fucks before the phrase give zero fucks existed. <laughs> she didn't live within the pigeonholed lines of high school cliques. She was simultaneously a cheerleader, a theater geek, and a partier who hung out in our high school smoking section wearing her black leather jacket. Yes, there were smoking sections in school, is it one time? <laughs> At a moment's notice, she'd jump in our friend Andrew's spacecraft, the Honda Odyssey, <laughs> to head to Rhode Island for a weekend-long rave. If you were her friend, you were under her wing, for better or worse. Having fun was important, but not at the expense of doing your best, intellectually or morally. One time, she called out our friend Marie on her grades. Marie was complaining that some assignment was lame, and Val retorted, That's bullshit. You're a genius. You're better than this place, so just get it done. I got through the second semester of my senior year by pretending she was just at school. I devoured her autopsy report when we finally got it. I told my parents I wanted to see it. We all wanted to see it. There's a surreal element to someone you love dying suddenly so far away. Val didn't die by some nefarious means. I just needed to read that it was a scientific fact that she ceased to exist, or at least her body ceased to function. It was the first step in finalizing the reality for me. The undisputed facts. There was no bargaining. I don't remember the funeral, whereas the wake included one of my most traumatic memories. Before they opened the doors, close family were allowed to go in first. Seeing her body was the second indisputable proof. A deep, choking, involuntary wail escaped me. Thirty minutes later, they let everyone else in, and I remember consoling our friends outside the funeral home. I don't remember if anyone got up and spoke at the wake, or if there were pictures of her and us. What I remember, and what I cherish, was sitting in small groups of family and our mutual friends sharing memories of her. Like one time, she called out our friend Scott, who she was dating at the time for being a dick, by walking right up to him and saying, You got a lot of fucking nerve. We laughed and cried over her together. I didn't know what to call it at the time, but that was the first time we all felt the grace of living in her spirit. In my early life, I never spent time thinking about spirituality. 
I had been unwillingly raised Catholic from birth and abandoned it precisely the day after my confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> my family's rules, Val and I had to be confirmed for our grandmother's sakes. After that, we could follow whatever religion we wanted. The majority of our friends were Reformed Jews. To me, religion was simply tradition. If I had spirituality at that time, I would have called it music and art. Being a teenager in the suburbs of New York in the early 90s was the best of many worlds. The city was rapidly transforming. I loved exploring independent movies, museums, hip-hop culture, emerging and renaissance music scenes like swing and ska. My friends and I would easily drive to the four train and go anywhere for $2. Val and I would sing along to cassette tapes driving to school, the Ramones, Public Enemy, Jane's Addiction. One time, Bad Religion 80 to 85 got stuck in the stereo. We listened to it every day for three weeks straight until we got the cassette tape out. She took me and my friends to see The Cure live in 1992, one of our first concerts without parental supervision. It took me several years to learn the value of recognizing Val's spirit in the day-to-day. -day. Since leaving the Catholic Church at 13, I had considered myself an atheist. When you die, your flesh is returned to the earth. Cycle of life. Science. That's it. Most religions provide solace in the faith that loved ones continue on in some form. Heaven, afterlife, mortal souls, next lives. Not having those beliefs mostly leaves you asking the question, why? It wasn't until my 30s that a therapist suggested I dedicate to Val little moments that remind me of her and celebrate her through stories and shared loves. I've come to think of this as living in her spirit. Even though it's been almost 30 years since her death, every time I'm with my family or high school friends, we share memories of her. And inspired by my sister, I'm that friend who will call you on your bullshit. <laughs> Just like she did. When I face a challenge, I think about what her advice would be. Nowadays, when asked the question, do you have any siblings, Dana? I no longer lie. I say yes. I accept the sympathetic, sympathetic responses that make other people feel less awkward. I'm comfortable telling them I had a sister who passed away when I was 17. I know now that the usual sequential question, were you close, is more about them than me. Some people aren't close to their siblings, even in childhood and adolescence. There is nothing I wouldn't give to have my sister in my life as an adult. That being said, living in Val's spirit has served me well. I value whatever time I have left alive. I value the people in my life, even those who have come and gone. Whenever I am fearless, outspoken, or brutally honest, I pay homage to her. Sometimes I catch a glimpse of her expression in the mirror. When I listen to Bad Religion, The Ramones, Public Enemy, and many other back-in-the-day faves, part of the joy I feel is the spirit of Val and memories of the time we did have together. I find my own courage to stand up here and tell my story, in part because I know she would tell me, you only have one life. Do everything you want, even the shit you think you can't do. Talking about her, even to strangers like you, right now, is part of living in her spirit. It turns the sadness of her loss into a celebration of the person she was.